Welcome to Survive the Jive. I'm Tom Rousel. I'm an historian. And today I'm going to debunk Children's BBC, who have created a song for their Horrible Histories program about two years ago on their YouTube channel uh, called Been Here From The Start, which makes a number of egregious false claims about the history of Britain, trying to depict it as a place in which sub-Saharan African people have always played a significant and important part and have always been present. I'll debunk each of the false claims today. After the first chorus, which is awful, there is a verse which claims that the Mesolithic population of Britain, uh, typified by the example everyone knows, Cheddar Man, uh, uh, who is in fact a member of a race that was found all across Western Europe, from Sweden to Spain, which was known by geneticists as the Western hunter-gatherers. They were not black. They were not even related to African people today, sub-Saharan African people in any way. In fact, modern white people are more closely related to black people than Western hunter-gatherers were. In fact, no race on earth today has any genetic relationship specifically to the Western hunter-gatherers except white people. White people are the only people who descend from Western hunter-gatherers to any significant degree. Their cranial morphology is very typically European. They have uh, blue eyes like Europeans, and straight hair like Europeans, snub noses like Europeans. They are generally going to be European looking. It's possible, based on a prediction of their, the genes associated with complexion, that they had darker skin than what modern Europeans have. That's a possibility, although many scientists have called for caution when talking about that, because we can't accurately predict skin colors in such an ancient population. However, even if they were dark-skinned, it doesn't make any difference because they are not sub-Saharan African blacks. Nelson Mandela is called black because he is sub-Saharan African. He doesn't actually have black skin, he's quite light-skinned, but he's still called black. Tamils from South Asia have very dark skin, but they're not called black because they are not from sub-Saharan Africa. When you say black in Britain, you mean sub-Saharan African. And this man, Cheddar Man, had no sub-Saharan African DNA at all. He was not related to sub-Saharan Africans. It is a complete lie to say that he is. It's completely fictional. Skipping forward 8,000 years or so, probably couldn't find any people they could claim were black during that massive period. Next, we come to the period of the Roman occupation of Britain, and they bring up Emperor Septimus Severus as an example of a black man, although he was not a black man at all. He was about, about probably half Roman, which is basically Italian, and half North African, which uh, means not black. North Africans today are not black, of course, they're of West Eurasian origin. Mm, some of them have you know, Arab DNA, but even before the Arab expansion into North Africa, the overall population of North Africa was of West Eurasian descent. That means it comes from the Middle East and Europe. The population of North Africa today is not called black. However, they often have little bits of black DNA because the Muslims, during the Muslim period in medieval times, the Muslims enslaved black people and sometimes interbred with them. And so sometimes you'll find like residual black admixture, sometimes five or even 10 percent uh, black admixture in North Africans today. But we still don't call them black. But before that, in the Roman period, when we're talking about now, there was no black admixture in these people. They weren't black at all. Uh, Septimus Severus had no black ancestry. And in fact, there's a story about him, possibly apocryphal, but it's still very revealing. That about when he encounters uh, an Ethiopian Roman soldier. Ethiopian didn't just mean from Ethiopia, it just means black. Ethiopia means burned skin in Greek, basically. So it's what they called all black people. And the soldier spooks Septimus Severus so much that he thinks it's a bad omen seeing such dark skin. So not only was Septimus Severus not a black man, he was actually racist against black people. The next false claim they make, is also in the Roman era, and it concerns about 300 Maori soldiers or Mori soldiers serving under Aurelius. The man singing the song refers to them as the brave Aurelian Moors. The Moor is a, an English word that derives from the old Latin word ma Mori, which is what they refer to um, North African people, basically the same as modern day Berbers. Berbers are not black. Some Berbers today do have a sub-Saharan African admixture for the aforementioned reason with the contact during the Islamic slave trade. 
Uh, the Moors back in those days, or rather Maori, did not have any black admixture. They were not black people. They were, they were Berbers. So again, it's completely wrong to call them black. Black means sub-Saharan Africans. Berbers are not white people, but it would be more accurate to call them white people than to call them black people because they're genetically more related to white people than they are to black people. So if, if it would be dishonest to refer to the Berbers as white, it's even more dishonest to refer to them as black. One of the lines says, before Harold lost at Hastings, black people played their part. What does that mean? So far in the song, they have not succeeded in coming up with a single black person. In fact, there probably were a few black people in Roman Britain and maybe some after as well, but Han, you know, very rare, like the Ethiopian soldier that Septimus Severus saw, for example, if that story is true, then there's a black soldier. There might have been black soldiers. We haven't actually found any yet. We haven't actually found any. Many of the skeletons that have previously been called ancient black Britain, such as Ivory Bangle Lady and Beachy Head Lady, have subsequently, after DNA analysis, been proved not only not to really be black, but not to have any black ancestry at all completely non-black. And these are people the BBC on their website have formally listed as the greatest of the black Britons. They weren't even black. One of them was from uh, of mixed North African and European heritage, and the other was entirely of Southern European heritage. They didn't have any black ancestry, but they were so eager to call them black that they not only, you know, on you know, guesswork based on the skull, called them both black, but they also listed them as great black Britons on the website of the BBC. Who is regulating the BBC? Aren't they supposed to now have some kind of, you know, fact-checking department? Why don't they fact-check themselves? And why isn't Ofcom the regulatory body for the United Kingdom that makes sure that false information, fake news, disinformation isn't broadcast, hasn't done anything about it? Why don't Ofcom care? These are important questions to ask. Okay, so let's skip forward 1,500 years to the Tudor period, which is the next verse. And here they claim that uh, John Blank, who was the trumpeter of Henry VIII, was black. And actually, they got this one right. He really was a black guy. Spain, as I mentioned, the Muslims controlled it and they had uh, an African slave trade. And some of their slaves were granted freedom if they converted to Islam. And as a result, some black people who had formerly been slaves could become free. Uh, and then you had a population of a few black people within the Moorish population. And that's the, why the confusion today when some people think Moor means black, because during, you know, Tudor times, there were some people who were black who were referred to as Moors. But DNA analysis of a Moorish cemetery reveals that there were more white Moors than black Moors. In fact, they didn't find a single black Moor in the cemetery. There were just a couple with some African ancestry, sub-Saharan African ancestry, so they might have been classed as black. But the original Moors were North African, which means like Middle Eastern, basically. And they enslaved white people and black people. And some of those whites and blacks converted to Islam and became free and were then called Moors. So being a Moor in that period could mean you were either black, Middle Eastern or white. But more likely, you were Middle Eastern. The blacks and the whites were a minority of the Moors. And at no point does Moor just mean a black people. So just because someone is called a Moor, that doesn't mean they're black. In fact, there were in the cemetery where the DNA analysis of Moorish skeletons happened, there were more white Moors than black Moors. But you wouldn't assume that Moor means white person because that's wrong. It's just because of their slavery. Now, John Blank was probably descended from one of these freed slaves, and he ended up in England. Why? Because the court of Henry VIII needed to, he needed to demonstrate, the king needed to demonstrate his worldliness, his power. And having an exotic man from the far reaches of the earth with such an unusual complexion that would shock everybody and cause everyone in the court to gossip and talk about what an impressive sort of menagerie of uh, exotic things and people and animals this king of England has. Uh, that's the reason that he was there. He was literally a human trophy to show the king's power and influence. He was not himself a historically important figure. John Blank played a trumpet. He's not any more important than anyone else who plays a trumpet. It's not, he wasn't part of a black community. He wasn't part of a, you know, some black British identity that never existed. He was just a trumpeter from Spain who was used as a status symbol by an English king. 
The next claim they make is also from roughly the same period, uh, and it concerns a woman also born in Spain, and she was called Catalina of Motril, and she was not black. She was probably of Moorish descent, uh, and therefore she might be of mixed North African and Spanish descent. We don't have her DNA. Nobody called her black. She certainly doesn't... There's no reason to think she was black. Uh, it's completely arbitrary to call her black, to make up that she was sub-Saharan African. And as I say, based on scientific evidence of Moorish cemeteries in Spain, it would be much more statistically likely that she was white than she was black, uh, or that she was Middle Eastern, which would be most obvious because more is a Middle Eastern. Uh, but yeah, if she wasn't Middle Eastern, she'd be more likely to be white than black. So yeah, again, they fail to find a black person in their list of, you know, we've been here from the start. This trying to portray Britain as a place which has always uh, hosted a black community. It's not, it's not true. It's never happened. And occasionally a black person might show up like one, you know, here or there in history, and they are not a continuous popular community. They come, they go. They're, the idea of a black Britain is entirely modern. Even when we actually start having a real black community here in the 1950s after Windrush, they're a tiny, tiny amount of the population. When I was born in the mid-1980s, this country was still 95% white, and the non-white population was more comprised of South Asians than it was of blacks. They, have, they weren't even a big part of this country in the 1980s. Although even in the 1980s, they were overrepresented in the BBC media because there's been a push for decades to try and exaggerate the significance of sub-Saharan Africans in Britain and its history. Why? I don't know. You'll have to work that out yourself. But this ultimately is a criminal misrepresentation of British history, and it is undermining the sense of continuity of the indigenous peoples with their historic culture, and trying to claim that newcomers, remember most of the black people in this country now are nothing to do with the Windrush generation, they came here in subsequent decades, and have no claim to the ancient history of these islands. None of the Windrush generation have any relation to any of the black people who ever did visit Britain in the past because the descendants of the you know Afro-Caribbean people ultimately hail from West Africa places like Nigeria Gabon Niger along the on the western coast of Africa whereas uh, the Moors uh, took their slaves from further north so the Moors would have taken some black slaves into Spain and some of those somehow in the you know in the Tudor period may have made up made an appearance in Britain but uh, they didn't form communities by the way all those North African Romans that came here uh, during um, you know the Roman occupation they left no legacy and they didn't stay we know that because there's been thorough genetic studies of pre-Roman Britain and Roman Britain and post-Roman Britain, many different studies, and they have all come to the conclusion that the Roman occupation left no genetic legacy in Britain, and that there is genetic continuity, such that the, the Britons, after the Romans left, are exactly the same genetically as those that had been before the Romans ever came. The people that the Romans stationed here were very diverse. They included Germanic people, uh, Middle Eastern people, North African people, People from all over the empire were stationed as soldiers. But, you know, is Iraq now very American? Has it got lots of British and Irish ancestry because Iraq was occupied by American soldiers? No. There was just a military occupation. Or even the British Raj. India was occupied by Britain and ruled by Britain for hundreds of years. The average Indian person has zero British ancestry. Just because a military or colonial force occupies a country, that doesn't mean that everyone has sex with the soldiers. That's not how it happens. Uh, of course, there is no um, genetic uh, impact from the Roman Empire, actually, in Britain. It just didn't happen. And this has been very well documented scientifically. The continuity of British DNA is not disrupted at all until the Anglo-Saxon invasions. And they did make an impact, uh, as I've discussed in other videos in the past. If you'd like to learn more about this sort of thing, have a look at some of my old videos. I keep having to debunk the nonsense that is put out by uh, lying fake media like the BBC. 
So if you want to have a more honest approach to history, keep watching Survive the Jive. Thank you. Have a nice day.